sort of a little bit about myself um, before I get started, and I'll kind of give you guys the outline for what I'm thinking uh, we'll do, and hopefully we'll be able to keep this fairly interactive. And if, if at any point you have questions about the material, uh, don't interrupt me. Um, I'm happy to stop and answer questions and kind of talk about things that come up. So I want to try to make this as applicable to all of you as I can. Um, so I, I actually, I'm from Birmingham. I did, my, did medical school in Birmingham. I did all my training in Boston. Uh, in medicine at Mass General at the Medical Medical Care Fellowship Combined Program that she presented and they came back last year. Uh, and this uh, just took over as the medical director of the ICU uh, a month ago uh, at, uh, at UAB. So we do a lot of, so some of these talks, the reason I mentioned that is that these talks are kind of a combination of a couple of different talks that I give. Uh, I, I, for the last couple of years, I've given a sepsis noon conference talk for the UAB residents. Um, so we've got some of that that's more for formal didactics, but we also have an, have an ICU morning report that we, that, that we do on a rotating basis. Um, and so once a month, I give a, another sort of a sepsis pathophysiology talk. So what I'm going to start with is actually that discussion, which is a little bit more hopefully interactive. Um, I'm going to ask you guys some questions uh, depending on time. We may even I may even have you guys break up into some small groups and talk about how you'd want to manage patients, and then we can kind of we can come back and you can tell us uh, what you'd want to do. Um, but I want to start by kind of laying the groundwork. I'm not I don't intend for this to be uh, too basic for you. So if 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 it's if it seems like I'm I'm undershooting you, I apologize. But I feel like generally speaking in medical education, we don't do a great job of going back and talking about pathophysiology as much as we should. We do, a, you know, much of our focus in ward teaching and rounding um, bedside rounds is on acute management and decision making and, and how do you, uh, you know, what are you supposed to do? And, and oftentimes we, we lose the, we sort of lose the opportunity to go back and say, well, why, why are we doing it? So I'm, my hope is that we can, this can be a practical talk, um, but also one that uh, we cover some of the evidence, uh, most recent surviving sepsis guidelines, at least the, the, high, the highlights of those, um, and reiterate some of what I think are sort of important uh, pathophysiological mechanisms. So uh, I'll start. The first sort of section is, is probably will take us maybe half hour, 45 minutes, maybe longer, depending on, on the discussion, um, is going to be generally about shock in general. And then the second portion of it uh, so the second portion of the talk will be more about sort of sepsis itself and a little bit of specific sepsis pathophysiology and focusing on early goal-directed therapy. Uh, so the, the sort of the, the, my objective for the first part of this talk is to get you guys thinking about identifying shock. Again, this is kind of, uh, you know, basic kind of stuff. What do you do at the bedside when you suspect shock or you get called to the patient who's hypotensive? Um, <coughs> differentiating shock, um, thinking through the different what are the different mechanisms, hemodynamics um, of different types of shock. And then I'm gonna sort of emphasize the importance of timing. And I think what I would say, I'm gonna use this sort of report here for a moment, <coughs> is that for, for this part of the talk, what I really want you to be thinking about um, is oxygen delivery, okay? So you guys know what are the determinants of oxygen delivery? You're gonna give me an equation. Cardio. Yeah, cardiac output times. Times what? Heart rate. So heart, cardiac output is heart rate times so cardiac output. Times difference. Yeah, so oxygen, we got an oxygen. So you're about to give me the thick equation, which is also. Times difference between. Uh, so that's actually oxygen, oxygen consumption, which is a thick equation, but it's very much related to oxygen, oxygen delivery. Um, so oxygen delivery is oxygen content, and you can just say CaO2. And how do you determine uh, oxygen content, arterial oxygen content? What are the what makes up ox uh, arterial oxygen content? So the hemoglobin bound yeah. and the dissolved. <coughs> So hemoglobin times a constant, which is 1.34. I'm not as concerned that you guys memorize this as much as using physiologic equations to think about clinical problems. But hemoglobin times 1.34 times something else. <coughs> What's that? So I heard a dissolved part. 
So PDO2 times 0 0.003, right? Um, that's a plus there. But this is multiplied by where is oxygen in the blood? Where's most of oxygen in the blood? Hemoglobin. Yeah, it's bound to hemoglobin. So, you, so this is your SAT, right? So your SAT, your hemoglobin saturation, um, and the oxygen bound to hemoglobin plus a minuscule amount that's bound that's dissolved within within the blood. Okay, so that's oxygen delivery. And the reason I, I think focusing and thinking about oxygen delivery when we're talking about shock and sepsis is that if you understand this, then you have a pretty good and you and you can you can figure out or at least understand uh, what Manning Rivers was trying to do with the Rivers Protocol, <coughs> which was trying to improve oxygen delivery. If you don't really understand oxygen delivery, <coughs> then you got to memorize everything that you're supposed to do, which you can do, but you got a lot of things that you have to memorize. And so my focus here is to make sure that you, I want to make sure you understand oxygen delivery and how perturbations in oxygen delivery, or actually more importantly, exactly what you said, which is oxygen consumption. So that's your VO2, oxygen consumption, which is cardiac output times the difference, CO2 minus CVO2. I apologize, my handwriting is awful. Uh, but so uh, the arterial oxygen content minus the venous oxygen content, um, that these two, primarily this, but to a lesser degree this, especially when we're talking about sepsis pathophysiology and oxygen utilization, are what I want you to think about when we're talking about shock, okay? And how uh, a diminishment of oxygen delivery <coughs> leads to findings and clinical findings in shock and sepsis. Okay, so think about, these are the things I want you to think about while we're talking about shock. Um, because something here has to be changed. You can have certainly severe anemia, you can have a reduction in heart rate, reduction in stroke volume, <coughs> um, or you can have significant enough hypoxemia that you cause oxygen delivery to diminish. And ultimately, um, the point I, I usually make, I give an ARDS, my, my clinical and, and research interests were in ARDS. <coughs> and so my, uh, I, I give two lectures, two morning lectures in the ICU. One is about basically the, the, ox, the um, <coughs> yeah. hypoxemia, and then which is hypoxemia would be this uh, reduced oxygen content, or PAO2 less than 60, SAT less than 88%. Uh, and then the other is this talk, which is, has to do with, with tissue hypoxia. Right, so if you think about this, you want to think about tissue hypoxia um, and, and a change in oxygen delivery. Okay, so I talk too long. Severe back pain, fever, dysuria, pyuria, she has pyelo. She's otherwise healthy. Um, I'm not trying to trick you with, with what the etiology is, is here. Is there blood pressure, heart rate, multicardic, she's febrile. What do you want to know? You're going to jump right to the ABG. <laughs> Nothing else, just an ABG. <laughs> Duration onset, I guess. Yeah, it, yeah, it's acute. So this has been going on for, for a few days, uh, kind of with progression from mild dysuria to now back pain and, and fevers. Is it any complicating factors? No, she's otherwise healthy. Okay. Yeah. Is, uh, any respiratory rate, yeah, oxygen saturation? Yeah, so I'll, she's sounding normal. Uh, she's sounding 95% on room air, uh, and her respiratory rate is about uh, 28. Confused, yeah, it's a great question. Why do you ask about confusion? Because it was uh, of hypoperfusion to the brain. Yeah, so you're looking for evidence of, of clinical evidence of end organ hyperperfusion. Mm -hmm. Or another way of saying or you're looking for clinical evidence of tissue hypoxia, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, so is she confused? She's she's kind of maybe a little bit disoriented, um, but she's not uh, she's able to protect her airway, she's awake, she's alert, she's conversant. Do you know what her urine output is? Yeah, so she just rolled in, but she kind of tells you that she just you know, hasn't noticed that she's been making a lot of urine. And why do you ask about urine output? And organ damage. Yeah, so you're looking for renal perfusion, right? Quick phrase, shortness of breath. She doesn't feel dyspnea. 
she just yeah she's she's known to be tachypneic, but she's not she's not struggling. She's not short of breath. Yeah, nothing noticed when you do your physical exam. So, uh, so we'll start with sort of history type questions. She hasn't noticed anything. Yeah. So we've got a sort of maybe mildly confused reports anecdotally. Maybe a drop in her urine output. Uh, her urine looks a little bit more concentrated. Uh, anything else you guys want to know from history? How does her skin look? Is she dry? Yeah, and she tells you that she's a little dizzy when she stands up. So, so you're going to want to get some more vitals and, and maybe check orthostatics. She's here in yeah, and so we're going to go ahead and jump to labs. We'll say their ABG is, is seven, it was about seven, uh, about 725, uh, PCO2 of about uh, 25 or so, and uh, and her lactate is, is about five. I'm just kind of just that, that is, is her like extreme teeth flushed, warm? Or so she's cool to yeah. touch. So you, you, uh, <coughs> you perform your exam, she's tachycardic, uh, she has a flow murmur. Uh, her lungs are clear. She's got some CVA tenderness, and she feels cool to cool to touch. Does she have any pre-existing medical conditions? She's completely healthy. She's not pregnant. She's not pregnant. <laughs> so that's that, that's pretty good. So so what 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 do you guys conclude from that? And what I told you? Hypoperfusion with end organ damage. Yeah. So you say she's in shock, mm -hmm. right? She's in shock. So so what, what is shock? So shock is, uh, let's see. Still not working. Yeah, uh, sorry. Let's swap it. Hold the other one Sorry, I always break uh, these. Pull, pull I... the other one out. I think oh, one, there you go. The one yeah. you was supposed to. I did. I'll break this one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so this is just the definition. It's an older definition, but that's no different. Shock represents the failure of the circuit core system to maintain adequate. Oh, no, no, that's fine. This is better than I usually have. Uh, so, yeah, shock represents the failure of the circuit core system to maintain adequate delivery of oxygen, other nutrients to tissues, causing cellular and then organ dysfunction. This equation, right. And then the next, the corollary to that is, what, what can we do to fix it? Earlier resuscitation may restore effective tissue perfusion and normalize cellular metabolism. All right, so you've already covered all these, right? She was tachypneic, she was oliguric, uh, and she's tachycardic, she's hypotensive, um, though maybe for uh, you know, someone in their 20s, a blood pressure mm -hmm. systolic of around 90 or a little bit less than 90, may or not, may not that, that in and of itself doesn't necessarily mean that she's in shock, but it does mean that she's hypotensive. Uh, she's a little bit altered, though it can certainly be subtle, less subtle than elderly patients, as you guys are probably well aware. And then if you, you know, we, we had some trip markers. This is mostly sort of a marker of either significant enough acidosis to where you're attempting to have respiratory compensation, or maybe early lung injury in the setting of someone with septic shock. Um, and uh, and then of course usually later on this isn't something that you're necessarily getting immediately but mild bump in say uh, LFTs or even I'd say cardiac biomarkers um, acutely or subacutely in septic shock. All right, so this is kind of again getting at the point of what is <coughs> what are we talking about when we're talking about oxygen delivery? All right, so this is one of those kind of classic Guyton uh, physiology uh, images here. So this is, if you're sort of just as a reminder, you have a PO2 of about 95 and kind of normal homeostasis <laughs> being delivered to the tissues. <clears throat> Here within the interstitium, so you have a gradient, right, from what's being delivered in the arterial circulatory uh, bed uh, into the interstitium and then into the cells. And cells, you know, can, it's sort of, you know, depending on what you read, there, there certainly would be debate, but can, um, can continue to perform kind of normal metabolism down to a tor of somewhere between probably um, a two and six. So it, it certainly there's plenty of capacity within the system before you develop begin to, to develop uh, cell cellular hypoxia, right? But so you've got an oxygen delivery component here. Uh, ox the <coughs> molecules of oxygen move from the interstitium into the cells, and then of course the reverse side of this is that carbon dioxide is produced, and then 
uh, the lungs being a, an organ of excretion as well as, as one of nutrient acquisition uh, will then, with an offload of carbon dioxide here, we are showing the reverse model of this. Uh, and then in the end, if you get a venous capillary, uh, PO2 of about 40 or so. So just as a reminder of kind of what, what we're thinking about. And then what determines interstitial PO2? <clears throat> so one is consumption. So if, if consumption of, of oxygen increases, so if you have high metabolic demand, septic shock, um, or any type of shock for that matter, but certainly septic shock, <coughs> uh, running a marathon, uh, you, you, if you increase, increase your oxygen consumption here for any given uh, cardiac output, this is cardiac output, this is interstitial PO2, and then the lines re uh, represent uh, the, this is normal O2 consumption versus increased O2 consumption. So for any, if you, if you maintain cardiac output at the same level, um, but you increase oxygen consumption, then your interstitial PO2 would drop, right? <coughs> Makes sense, your cellular PO2 would drop, your interstitial PO2 would drop. Um, but fortunately, when oxygen consumption increases, we also normally increase our cardiac output if we're able to. We attempt to increase our cardiac output. How do we attempt to increase our cardiac output instead of increased oxygen consumption? Heart rate. Yeah, heart rate, one, yeah. It's still yeah, so you tend to get both an increased inotropy, right, with, say, if you have a release of epinephrine, uh, <coughs> increased inotropy, increased heart rate um, to, to increase your, your cardiac output. So you increase your cardiac output in an attempt to sort of compensate for, um, for the drop in PO2 so you maintain oxygen delivery. I'll just back to the oxygen delivery. Okay. That makes sense to everyone so far? Let's see where I'm going. All right, so that, I, again, we, we, you already brought up the FIC, you're ahead of the game here. Uh, the reason I, I put FIC here is just from an oxygen consumption standpoint, the other side of the equation um, is what are the cells actually doing and are the cells able to utilize oxygen? So as we talk about sepsis, we'll, I'll talk, and especially about sepsis pathophysiology, we'll, we'll touch on this idea of mitochondrial dysfunction in sepsis <coughs> and the idea that um, that it is not it is not simply a macrovascular supply issue in sepsis. That's a big part of it, and that's what you're worried about early on. Um, but there's also a component that is not necessarily treatable: the component of mitochondrial dysfunction, and inability to utilize oxygen, which is the the venous part. So we think about the central venous sap. At least part of the reason why we think about central venous sap. Okay. So variables. Y'all already brought these up: chronotropy, inotropy, uh, oxygen delivery, hemoglobin, and what is your SAT and oxygen extraction. Good. Can we, let me turn this off for a second. Um, can you turn that off? All right, so my apologies if this is, if this is uh, too basic for you guys. But throw, throw out the uh, kind of the big picture causes of shock. So kind of the big categories, and we'll say atrial <coughs> pressure. Circulatory. <coughs> <coughs> Yeah, so volume, right? Okay. Septic shock. And what is septic shock? For the, the category when it comes to septic shock. So, distributive. Yeah, starts with the distributive. So, within distributive, you would have the primary that we think about as sepsis. But don't forget about the anaphylactic shock. We are taking, especially taking care of patients in the ICU, we give people a lot of drugs, and it's easy sometimes to forget about the changes in, uh, in blood pressure could be related to something that we're doing to them. Um, so don't forget about anaphylaxis, especially in the patients who I see, um, you don't always see the other signs of, they're not always gonna tell you that their throat's closing in because they're already intubated. Um, cardiogenic. Yep, yeah, cardiogenic. What's that? Yeah, neurogenic is a little bit like a distributive 
ethnology. In volume, you know, you'd put sort of your hemorrhage and 